Well, when we first moved in was 1968. When we came to Southdown, at least we had the lift, which was one thing. So I had the lift so you could get the pram in and you could get down and go out to the shops. That was the one thing. And also we had a bathroom. We had three bedrooms which we needed because we had a boy and a girl. So there was a lot of things for it, even though I didn't like the place when we came and had a look at it. It looked like a great big prison. That's what I'd say. Because it wasn't, no, it wasn't very nice, was it, architectural? It was a, at that time, though there must be very few people perhaps who remember, but it was four huge blocks um, covered in glass. All the balconies were glassed in and the stairs and you could walk round the entire estate without your feet touching the ground. I, I, I don't know about the architect the, uh, who, who done the flats, but... With those it, it was the we, way they were built, wasn't it? Like this. That's how they were built. We we were on uh, the first floor first of all. First of we? all, we were on the first floor. But yeah. yeah, the people above you. Yeah. If when we went upstairs to our bedrooms, the people above you went downstairs yeah, to their bedrooms. bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. So the people up above you with that underneath you. Yeah. That's it. And vice versa, you know, yeah. the, that's how they were built, you yeah. know. Older housing was built before the First World War. It had been in the private landlord rented sector. We'd had very tight rent control for 60 years by then, 50 years by then. So no repairs, no amenities, often shared toilets, often a shared kitchen on landings, um, hadn't been modernised and there was no money to modernise it. And the council, instead of looking carefully at how it could actually modernise either the private rented sector or turn it into socially provided housing, which is effectively what happened 10 years later, they had this big slum clearance plan which ran from 1930 to 1975, tearing it down and replacing it with council estates because people thought it was better to put something new up. GLC, wasn't it? Yeah. The Greater London Greater Council. London they, they built quite a few flats after the war and uh, that's where Rob's mum and dad moved to. I lived in um, a street called Popham Street, which had very, very old buildings in it. And um, we had two, two bedrooms, uh, no bathroom, a scullery, no hot water, <laughs> no electricity. <laughs> We didn't have much of anything. <laughs> but, but they were solid though, weren't they? Oh, they were solid flats, yeah. yes, yes. You could sit in your in your flat and you never heard anybody else. So in the 20s and 30s, there was a, a, a slum clearance scheme and a lot of the old properties, the slum properties in central London were demolished and rebuilt by the London County Council, but increasingly by the local boroughs. Now Finsbury, which is the southern part of Islington, which was a separate borough, had a very strong Labour Party representation. So from 1928, almost continuously for the next 40 years, it had a Labour majority, a very strong Labour majority. And it was one of the areas, not just in London, but in the country as a whole, that built the greatest proportion of council housing. Um, and it linked council housing to a whole plan for healthy living. So it put a lot of money into child and maternity services. It funded the Islington, or what was called the Finsbury Health Centre. It was still the same though. I mean, when we moved into our flat after we got married, which was 58, there was still no electricity, was there? No. We had to have the electricity put on. Pay for that ourselves. Uh, in the 1950s, the Conservative government actually of the day actually pushed through a larger council house programme and campaigned in the election on a building more council houses cheaper than Labour would do it at a higher standard and won the election. It was the number one issue was people needed houses just like they do today. The quality of build was very high in the 50s. In fact, it was, it was high all the way through from the, the very first council house in London, the 1890 Boundary Street Estate in Bethnal Green. Very high quality of construction. But in the 60s, 
when you start to see a conservative government beginning to pull back subsidies from housing, they still they put up a lot of council housing, but they reduced the subsidies and the quality went down. And we lived there for five years five, in that yeah, flat. Right. Then we moved to a, a bigger flat in the same block, still, still an, old, an old block. But when we got there, they did have electricity in that one, didn't they? Yeah. And that's when our daughter was born. She was born in 63. Our son was born in 66. And then we moved here in 68. And our youngest son was born when we lived in Market Estate. And so it was internal 1960s development, very much built in, in kind of theoretical concepts rather than having any relationship to the world around it. So it just sort of landed it from Mars here, as it were. Um, it was it was regarded at its time when it was opened as a, as, a, as an architectural uh, example, an exemplar, if you like, of, of design, post-war design. The, the you know the tower blocks that were put up in the 60s were part of a, a kind of 60-year-old, in fact, probably nearly 100-year-old tradition almost of what was called modernist architecture. And the idea was uh, it goes back to a French architect, or it's actually a Swiss French architect called uh, Le Corbusier was that you would create cities that would be machines for living. They would be efficient. They wouldn't be congested. So what you would have is a ground level where you'd have the traffic and movement. And then above that, you would get the living area. So pedestrians would be uh, isolated from traffic. And you could see exactly why that was you know, something it sounds like a great idea. That's what happens in the Barbican. I, I enjoyed living on the estate. I was on the ninth floor, and so I had a kind of panoramic view where I could almost see from Canary Wharf across through to uh, the post office tower, and had the park below it, and also the estate. So I was kind of above the estate, if you know what I mean, looking down on it. I wasn't at the centre where the the it was a little bit more erratic if the if the kids were on scooters or there was stuff going on, you know. Whenever you had anything go wrong in the flats, um, and the workmen used to come, and they used to say, well, I've got to go back and I've got to find the plans to find out where, where I've got to look for this leak that's coming through. And the town hall always said they could never find the plans for Market Estate. So everybody used to say no because they'll end up suing the architect <laughs> because they found so many defects going on. So I don't know who the architect was, but presumably at that time, it was the in thing to do things like that, you know, to what the way they did them. Or the poor souls who lived on the top floors in the maisonettes, whose water was not connected to the, to the rest of the flats. Yes. Oh, the poor, I used to feel so sorry for them because I, as I would be, I'm having to explain again and again and again. No, it is not the market estate. It's the flats on the top floor that have got an entirely separate water system and heating system. Who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> you, you, you had your problems, though. I mean, the, uh, a, lot, a lot of things that happened, uh, i.e. The, the water. Yeah. That used to go off, you know, yeah. you turn a tap on, no water. I think back in the, the post-war years, there were a lot of very concerned architects. Architects on the whole care about society. They want to do um, the best they can. They want people to have new homes and good places to live and great streets to walk down. They don't want to create places that are um, a nightmare to live in. But they also, back then, really thought they knew best and they came up with some bright new ideas. They thought, there are the slums of the past, they've been bombed, they look um, terrible, people lived on streets, surely these cramped conditions are no good for them. What they want is light and space and air. This is how we're going to do it. But they didn't actually talk to the people that were going to be moving in. Uh, so everything that was built really up until the 70s, I would say, didn't involve consultation with residents. It was the we know best School of Architecture. And they went bad from the very start. Only, we moved on there. Only, only when the uh, the kids started getting a bit old and they started running riot. Yeah, but it was bad when we first moved on there, Rob. With all that glass being smashed. Yeah, no doubt. But there again, it is yeah, your hooliganism, you know. Yes, that's right. But that that is what happened. That that's, that that happened right from the beginning. I mean, we used to have milk delivered. I'd come home and find the milk 
smashed all along the corridor and all the glass and the milk gone. Social housing in the 60s was council housing. It was publicly funded, publicly built, owned by local authorities and aiming to house modest income, low income people who usually were being pushed out of previous slums. The end of that came in the 60s and they realised that not Apart from the fact that they were poor, some of the 60s, late 60s town lots were poorly built, but that moving a variety of different people in with different social needs didn't work. So there were social problems started to emerge on the estate. Um, and then councils began to have to allocate housing according to need. And of course the neediest are the, often the people that have most chaotic lives, um, that have the most social, uh, and the most problems to deal with. So council housing, which had been seen as um, absolutely fantastic, became it then became seen as more of a residual, and so it got a really bad name. Whereas in the 40s and 50s, you'd be extremely proud to be a council tenant, and many people still are. Because of the rate of council building, so councils wanted to build, they like building, they withdrew more and more services from estates. So for example, they withdrew caretakers, they withdrew on-site supervision, they withdrew repairs teams in order to have more money to build. And so estates became more and more badly run. One, one little thing, we had, we had a communal shoot, right, to put the rubbish down. Um, and not blaming anybody, but now and again somebody put something down that was too big, so it would block the chute, and then... They would sing a push chair down Yeah, there. yeah, you know, probably your yeah. bows finding things and just thinking for a joke, we put it down there. But then the rubbish chutes got full up, you know, and you used to have horrible smells and it used to be all piling up on the on the landing. On the landing oh, they used to set fire to it. Then they used to set fire to it, yes. You know, so and you used to have all the rubbish downstairs. So obviously council estates went exactly the same way over an even shorter period as the old slums had gone. If you don't repair a place and maintain it and take care of it, then it runs down. I'm not really aware that there was much of a relationship with the council. They just, they collected the rent, um, obviously, um, never, never, never saw anybody. I, there was originally, when I, when I moved in for, for, for a, at least two or three years, there was a neighbourhood office at the top of, um, of North Road, quite close to um, Clock Tower Place, the block in, in which I lived, but that subsequently closed. So people would go in there and, and um, uh, you know, for repair issues and that sort of thing. But then I think when that closed, um, then it became very distant. Right from its beginning, council housing was provided at low rent. So there was never a huge budget for repair. But councils historically did not keep on one side the rent money they collected for tenants in order to repair the estates. They took the rent money into their council budget and spent it on building, on libraries, on leisure, on whatever. Um, and so council estates historically have been very under-resourced. From the early 1980s, rents were pushed up a lot, like doubled, precisely so that the landlords, councils, would spend on repair. And the government introduced a rule which was called ring fencing of the housing revenue account. So when a tenant's rent went into the council, that rent had to be spent back on the homes. What changed in the 1980s when they brought in uh, right to buy? And that took a million houses out of the public ownership in the 10 years that followed. Um, and that's even continued to grow. And they were not replaced. So what that has meant is there was less social housing available for people. And councils were not encouraged from the 1980s to build social housing. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, when, when Thatcher was in power, as we all know, she instigated the right to buy. So lots of properties, lots of social housing over the entire country was sold off. 
But the worst thing of all about that policy, um, setting aside the morality of selling social, social hours in any way, but the very worst thing of all <clears throat> was that she forbade the councils, that the money that, that, that was uh, uh, garnered from the selling off of the social housing didn't go to the councils, it went to the treasury. And the councils were forbidden from even spending any money um, or, or capital receipts on, on, uh, uh, on repairs or you know, proper refurbishments. They just simply weren't allowed to. So it was, all a, it was, all, it, it was a, a Thatcherite policy of running down social housing so that it would just wither on the vine and disappear. I remember arguing with Clay Freud, Clement Freud, who was also a liberal, about um, uh, the right to buy. I thought, what a brilliant idea. It will get all people who would never believe that they could do get their first step on the housing ladder, plus the fact that we wouldn't have to do all their repairs. But I assumed, stupid, that the money that, that, that was put in would be used to build other social housing. Sadly, Mrs. Thatcher said, you will pay back the money you have borrowed. Didn't get used for that. Did not get used for that. And I was furious. When I moved into the estate was in 1988. And it was like living in Beirut. It's the only way I can explain it. There was burnt out cars, burnt out motorbikes. Uh, the corridors were set alight where the rubbish was left. Um, it was a magnet for trouble, um, literally from the day I moved in. The building where we used to live, we really used to panic in the winter time because I never seen any walls in the building sweating on the winter time. It used to be a water running on the walls. It's like steam, you know. And that's what we was really worried. The council, half the time, they didn't give a monkey's about the state of the place itself. That's what it seemed like. You see, I mean, if, if people go around ripping doors off and things like that, not, I mean, when we was in the other block, I mean, people literally cut holes in the wall, you know, so you had like a, a walk through. And we know that happened. After three to four years, I didn't have even a carpet in my place. I didn't have a nice furniture in my place because anytime rain, the water come from the second floor to my bedroom. I had the safe place in my flat. It was only the kitchen. I used to have a single bed in my kitchen where to sleep. If you go in the bathroom, you need the umbrella with you. I moved to the estate when I was about 10 years old. So that's 13 years ago, so about 2001. Um, I remember that because I started school straight away in year six in Bregnock. When we first moved here, it was really, really dangerous. It was, I mean, I was young. We just got taken to school and back again. But I remember, like, hallways being burnt out, lights, um, electric circuits being burnt out, letterboxes, fire put through them. The, when I moved to the estate, the estate was very bad. It was a big building. It was 1997 and uh, it was like a hospital. Very dirty, very bad. After, after 10 years, they knocked down the house and uh, we moved up, moved back to the new houses. Some of the problems that the estate had was that because it was a kind of magnet for other problems in the general Holloway area, so people it wasn't just the people on the estate and it became a kind of focus for sort of things like drug dealing, for joyriding. And we also were, because we we're beside Caledonian Park, the park was quite neglected. And so the park was also a center for, for, for drug dealing, prostitution. Uh, so you had a kind of focus in a, in a wider area for, for Anti-social behaviour. Margot Dunn's been on. It was came onto the estate um, just after I moved in. I think it was 1990, and she came on the estate because people were complaining about water coming through. The um, leaks were everywhere. 
Um, and she did try her best to do it. She got St. built called like the Sydney Opera House thing. It was, you know, security cameras on the estate trying to catch the people that were breaking everything. In the mid 90s, Islington, mid late 90s, Islington spent significant sums of money on the estate. They'd taken, there were links between the blocks at a first floor level, it had taken down. They'd put new CCTV systems, they'd put in door entry systems to try and make it more secure to improve it. None of that had had any impact at all. So despite several million pounds being spent, mm. that had not been successful. So one famous New Year's Eve, the kids got in and they did a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage in one night as they got into the concierge um, uh, room, they, they wrecked the um, uh, computer system, they, they wrecked everything and nobody heard a thing. Nobody. And after that, more or less, Islington very cynically didn't invest any money in the estate. I think they deliberately chose not to put in the investment that was needed. It was passed over to Hyde Housing uh, to, to manage the estate. It wasn't an easy job, but there was also a death on the estate and that, that was a boy called Christopher Pullen. People were really, really angry. I mean, people were really affected by the, the loss of a, of a child. I mean, it was such, I remember I came back and uh, it was just at the corner of Southdown and the kids were, uh, well, I, I could see the kids doing something and I, I saw them with, I saw a light, right? And I'm like, what are you doing? And, and what they'd been doing was like a makeshift little shrine to Christopher and they were lighting candles and they said, Chris is dead. Hyde started the Tenants Association up um, in the October 2000. We became official in 2001. Um, it was just a lot of the adults, the parents who knew Christopher, whose kids were living on the estate got together and said, right, we'll start a tenant association up. We then went to the council, asked them what we had to do, and it's led from there. Metro, so the, the Market Estate Tenant and Residence Association, when I joined it, it, it was really sort of led by Jim Veal and Sharon Job was secretary treasurer. It, there was, it was kind of a small group, but it developed a, a certain momentum where, where you know, there, there was representation from other people and um, it, it, it kind of grew into a core of about um, 12, 15 people. And then when we had meetings, you know, we could, we could turn out 40 or 50 people. I thought there's nothing more we can do on the market estate. How about knocking it down and building streets? This is where people want to live. When we heard that there were plans to redevelop the market estate using park land, uh, albeit temporarily because it was always agreed that the park would be, end up being the same um, area but just differently configured. When we heard that the, there were these plans, various users of the park, um, we um, set up a group, um, it was called the Caledonian Park Users Group at that time, uh, really with the express intention of protecting the park from being used in redevelopment. Before we came on board during 2002, the council tr had produced planning guidelines for, for the park and the housing. And that had been very difficult, difficult discussions, hard fought battles. The thing that really set us off was um, uh, the February draft planning guidelines for this project, which showed on the east and west flank of the park housing development and um, these areas on the east and west flank were where um, trees had been planted in the 1980s to create woodland habitats and these gave nature conservation value to the park. Um, the park is designated as a site of importance for nature conservation um, for Islington Borough and it's also Islington's second largest park. It's a valuable open space. Uh, the, the estate could have been rebuilt into the park and then the park claimed out of the land, but this was just opposed and um, primarily by the kind of middle-class dog-walking dowagers of the Caledonian Park Users Group. So there was a, quite a bit of antipathy to them. And so the, 
we set up our own Friends of Caledonian Park. And so because the estate's quite big, we were, compared to the handful of people involved in that, we, we had 50 people and we got funding to do um, different projects, including consultations. And really we tried to, to take back um, some element of control in our, in our lives. So then we, we had um, the actual planning meeting and in this the view of the tenants prevailed and the guidelines allowed quite substantial take of park land. Southern agreed and one of them, to, to a lot of demands of people for what they envisaged the estate would be. We spent some time showing them other estates. One of the, uh, the schemes we visited was Bedsed in Sutton, I believe. And that was, uh, it was a very good uh, uh, scheme, but it was environmentally, it reached very high standard. It had things like wing, uh, windmills, electric cars, etc. They didn't want that. They perceived that they'd, li that they'd lived in, in an experiment. So they, so they wanted very traditional looking buildings. Um, a lot of the problems that, that the residents had faced beforehand were to do with unclear access, where were the, where were the front doors, the, the layout involved lots of long internal corridors, uh, but strangely, although it looked like there were an awful lot of homes there and it, some of it went up to eight storeys high, it was a very, very forbidding place, uh, there were actually less homes then than there are now, but we put back traditional streets with front doors where people can see where they go in. There aren't long internal corridors, there are short uh, calls where you go up your, upstairs, you find your front door, there's your flat. Open space was very important to them. Uh, they wanted gardens, they wanted balconies, so we made a commitment very early on that all residents would have either a garden or a balcony. We then had, uh, on the back of that, we had to have a ballot where, we, where all the residents were able to vote about whether or not they actually wanted to transfer the estate from, South, from Islington Council to Southern Housing Group. We, we were in a situation whereby we had to rely on private finance uh, to make the thing, uh, to, to, to borrow money to make it work, but we also had to get grants and, and support in. We had limited government grants. Islington gave a dowry, which was very helpful, but really to make the scheme stack up, we had, to dis, we had to have a sales scheme as well. We couldn't make the whole thing come together just based on social rented property uh, and the grant. So we had to have a mixed tenure scheme. For, that was one driver. There was in fact um, uh, basically a double presentation at the Goodinch um, Community Centre whereby there were two conflicting bids um, from two social landlords, one of which is Southern Housing and the other was Hyde, um, who also uh, a local um, social housing provider and they both bid um, to uh, refurbish, redo, demolish, rebuild the market estate and they both had uh, slightly different ideas of how it, sh how it could be achieved and then there was a, a vote um, where some, some weeks later um, there was a postal vote on which, uh, which option the tenants preferred and Southern won. We actually watched our new flat actually being built from our garden in our front rooms and then when it first started being put up I actually thought it was a car park because that was like the design it looked like it looked like it was just going round and round in circles. You could see the development through our windows things being knocked down um, the garage everything trees all around and they got built up very quickly and then the reverse again seeing them getting knocked down it was quite upsetting because we all left a mark in our old house, like our names or like painted little bits in there. But it's changed for the better, I think. I think it's really good about the way this is developed as the whole of the state is quite mixed. Uh, that um, people are living 100 metres away who have got reasonably expensive accommodation to people who are uh, living in social housing. I think that's a really good thing because it enables uh, people to meet and to have a mixed community, which I think is really important and one of the great things about the estate. Here is fine. Here they clean almost every day, um, routine of checkup. And emotionally, I feel so good. I feel happy, you know. 
It's quite relaxed. Your place is nice and big, clean. The attitude towards the area has completely changed as well. Um, definitely more comfortable, definitely more presentable. You don't feel embarrassed if people come to your house anymore, where I think a lot of people did before. Quite happy living here in, in the, the new flat. Took a little bit of getting used to after Market Estate, but we're, we're quite happy. The thing I feel about the estate now is that it's just a normal part of Islington, where it really was not a normal part, not only of Islington, but really of, of North London and, and really perhaps the country. You know, it, it was really a very different place compared to the prosperity of the capital. If you take a longer view of council housing and you look at the, uh, the different kinds of bills, different qualities, the different social and political and cultural context in which council housing was put up, you realise that there is no, not one but many different stories about council housing. And I think it's really important that those different stories are told because unless you tell a variety of different stories, you can't imagine it might have been different. People can actually have a say about things and you shouldn't take uh, the, the wrong decisions by a government or anyone uh, at face value. That's an important thing for working people in this area to know. And I think that's uh, you celebrating that people can have a say. That's an important part of people's heritage too. It's an important part of democracy and people shouldn't forget that. <laughs>